Um, uh, I wanted to tell you about some work that uh, I've been doing for a little while now um, with my colleague, uh, Toya Demarski at University of Kentucky. And uh, it's based on three papers which have come out so far. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and I'm gonna cover uh, bits of all three of those papers today. Just by way of introduction, um, as we all know now, information is at the heart of modern physics and modern approaches to quantum field theory. It's playing an increasingly important role in um, quantum gravity and uh, condensed matter theory and other areas of physics. And uh, it's given us a lot of new insight into the uh, information paradox for black holes and uh, in many body physics, it's uh, uh, teaching us how to characterize systems by information theoretic quantities. And the field of uh, quantum computing uh, in that field, information is elevated to the central object of study. <clears throat> so, um, and, and I think, uh, well, one thing we've learned is that thinking about quantum systems in terms of information gives us new perspectives and new insights into old problems. <clears throat> so the question, uh, um, the, the overriding question here, which, which I'm gonna give a specific answer to uh, today is what are the mechanisms by which quantum fields can encode information? And I will give a concrete answer for a simple class of quantum codes and a uh, simple um, one of the simplest classes of quantum field theories. So let me just uh, say something in the way of uh, deep background here that, that uh, uh, it's <clears throat> been known for some time that there is some connection between codes and uh, conformal field theories of the type I'm going to describe today. Uh, goes back to um, uh, uh, the... Uh, last century, in fact, the middle of the last century, uh, uh, starting then um, uh, with the discovery of the Golay code in 1949. <laughs> and that led, uh, or that, that was uh, followed by 20 years later by the discovery of the leech lattice, which it turned out was the lattice uh, associated with the Golay code. And uh, of course, the leech lattice then uh, led to the discovery of the monster group, the uh, uh, classification of finite simple groups, and the whole moonshine story, <clears throat> which I'm not really going to talk about today. But uh, I'm just saying that here is uh, already in this ancient history, we see relation between codes and conformal field theories, uh, namely the, uh, moon, the uh, monster CFT. So the, the general principle here is uh, that was that that we see in this history here, and that was exploited uh, also in in some uh, uh, later work in the late '80s and early '90s, is that a, a binary linear code of length n corresponds to an integral lattice in Euclidean space, which in turn determines a chiral lattice CFT. <coughs> And so uh, this gives a connection between these binary self-dual codes and chiral CFTs. So uh, obvious question is, these, these binary codes here are classical codes. And uh, the question, natural question is, can you extend this correspondence to quantum codes? And I'm going to answer that in the affirmative. <clears throat> The answer is going to be that self-dual, whoops, sorry, this is working now. Self-dual quantum stabilizer codes are uh, um, give rise to, uh, are associated with Lorentzian even self-dual lattices. And those, of course, are um, the basis for Narayan CFTs. <clears throat> so here's what I'm going to do. I'll start with a brief review of classical and quantum codes. And I'll give a little more detail on the quantum. Um, I, I guess I won't assume that you know what a quantum stabilizer code is. And uh, uh, 
actually I'm not going to say that much about this, but but uh, uh, I will I will touch on this classification we've given of real self dual stabilizer codes of lengths up to eight based on our construction. And um, uh, one observation there is we find many uh, uh, different codes and associated CFTs that are isospectral have exactly the same spectrum. <clears throat> Um, I'll talk about uh, what, what I'll call the code, code bootstrap, um, but which mathematicians know as just a, a, a linear programming procedure by which bounds are derived on, um, on uh, codes, classical and quantum. And uh, uh, in particular, there's a, a for self dual codes, which I'll define. There's uh, uh, imposing self-duality and positivity conditions gives a set of bootstrap-like constraints, which uh, can be solved and um, uh, which give you, uh, uh, which give rise to bounds that I'm gonna talk about on, in particular on the distribution of code words and on the uh, shortest length code word in a given code. And uh, that's what I say here, upper and lower bounds on error correcting capacity of, of codes of, of these self dual stabilizer codes will be consequences of this bootstrap approach. And then I'll say a couple of slides uh, more speculative about large end and holography. Let me start by um, uh, with a quick introduction to codes. And uh, we're gonna be talking about binary codes. These are codes over the field Z2. So their uh, code words are made out of N bits, zeros and ones. And uh, um, we'll in particular be talking about linear codes, which means that the sum of any two code words is another code word. So you can picture Z2 to the nth as an and the corners of an n-dimensional cube and uh, a code in general will be a subspace of the set of all the corners of the cube. So these green dots here are a possible code and it's a linear code. You can check that the sum mod two of any of these, any pair of these four vectors is another one of those four vectors. <clears throat> um, so you can specify a code since it's a, it's a linear space by a uh, basis of code words. In general, it'll uh, have a dimension lower than the total dimension of this cube. We'll call that dimension K. And in, in particular, this uh, code that I've drawn here has uh, a, a basis of two code words and it has a total of two to the, two to the K or four elements. Okay, so we arrange those uh, uh, to, to compactly specify the code. We can arrange those uh, vectors, basis vectors, into a matrix, a K by N matrix. K, remember, is the number of basis vectors, the dimension of the code subspace. And uh, so 1, 1, 0, and 0, and 1 were the uh, two basis elements. And then the entire code space is obtained by acting with this matrix or it's transposed rather on, um, on a general element of Z2 to the K. Okay, this maps uh, Z2, the K dimensional cube into the N dimensional cube, linear. So a quick example, uh, uh, a famous and maybe simplest example is the repetition code. It's a code in, uh, with three bits and there are just two code words, 000, zero, zero and 111. One, one. And so uh, N is three, K, the dimension of the code is one, and its uh, generator matrix is just a one by three matrix. And it, uh, it has the nice property of error correcting, uh, which is that if uh, someone sends you one of these code words over a noisy wire and one of the bits gets corrupted in the process of transmission, then uh, you can say, oh, look, that one doesn't belong there. My only code words are 000 and 111. So I'll just flip that one back and recover my original code word. 
Okay. That procedure works if the probability of an error is fairly small, so that the probability of having two errors is, is one over p squared. And uh, so that doesn't happen very often. Um, but uh, obviously, you'll get a better error correction if you have longer uh, repetition codes. So <clears throat> that this uh, repetition code has, has the property that 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1 are as different uh, from each other as any two points on this cube could be. They're as far in distance as they can be from each other. And uh, so we want to sort of formalize that property. What we want in order to have good error correction is for all the code words to be far enough apart from each other that we can easily distinguish them and correct small numbers of errors. Okay, so, the, uh, so we use the Hamming distance as a metric on uh, the uh, space of code words. And it's defined to be, uh, well, it actually looks like a, uh, a Euclidean metric squared between the two code words. And it counts, in fact, the number of non-zero bits where we're doing, yeah. remember C1 and C2 are all zero or one. So, uh, um, <clears throat> and the, uh, we also define the weight of an individual code word to be the number of non-zero bits or its Euclidean norm squared. Um, looks like my uh, picture is getting in the way, but this says that the, uh, the Hamming, sorry, the Hamming distance of a code is the weight of the shortest, uh, the or the lowest non-trivial weight code vector. You uh, take the minimum over all over the entire code of code words not equal to zero, and that is the called the Hamming distance of the code is also the minimum distance between any two code words by uh, translation agreements. And uh, uh, <clears throat> this Hamming distance D, if you have a code with a Hamming distance D, what that tells you is you can correct up to D minus one over two greatest integer bits. And here's a picture of why that's too, true. These, these uh, squares here represent code words. And the dots are, um, are other words which are not in the code, other uh, elements of, the, um, of our vector space. And so roughly, if we are within D over two of the center of one of these spheres, then um, uh, if, if these circular, circular dots represent uh, an, uh, what happens when an error occurs in this code word here, then uh, we can, uh, uh, as long as we're inside one of these spheres of radius d over two, we, uh, we can um, correct the error by going to the nearest actual code word. And this picture also gives an indication, I'm not gonna go into it, but. I know there's some interest in sphere packing and members of this audience. Uh, and uh, um, basically what we're, we're studying here is a sphere packing um, problem with uh, this uh, Hamming metric. Okay, so um, once again, going back to the repetition code, in that case, we have a Hamming distance of three. There are only two code words. And that means we can correct the error in one bit. The data rate, which is the number, the ratio of the number of bits that actually carry information uh, uh, to the, uh, so it's the ratio of the code subspace to the, uh, the dimension of the code subspace to the dimension of the total space, K over N is 33%. It's not a great data rate and repetition codes with more bits would, uh, have a, an even worse data rate. But uh, anyway, for uh, we'll label a code of this type an NKD code. N is the number of bits. Again, uh, K is the number of logical bits or the dimension of the code subspace. And D is this error correcting capacity, we call it. It's the length of the shortest code. Rate. So this is a 313 code. 
All right, so now we come to the central problem of coding theory, which is or maybe the most so important the problem. meaning of the second three here? So uh, the second three is, is D, is the Hamming distance. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so this is, this is what I would call the most important problem of coding theory, certainly occupied uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, effort in coding theory, uh, which is for a given N and K, what is the largest possible D, the largest, how much error correction uh, is possible? Okay, this is a hard problem and it's closely related to the lattice sphere packing problem. And as we'll see to other important problems, the, uh, the problem of uh, how to find the shortest vector in a, in a lattice and the problem of how to find the dimension of the lowest non-trivial primary in the CFT. <clears throat> um, so uh, the answer isn't known in general, it's known in specific cases, much like the sphere packing problem. So for an eight dimensions, for eight bits, uh, if you uh, want uh, K to be equal to four, a four dimensional code, then the optimal, the best you can do for, for the Hamming distance is four. So eight, four, four, this is called the extended Hamming code and turns out to be closely related to E8. Uh, in fact, it's associated with the E8 root lattice. It has a data rate of 50% because K over N is one half and it can correct one bit. For N equals 24, you also get uh, unusually good performance. You get, uh, there's a, a, a code with 12 logical bits and a Hamming distance of eight. That's the Golay code. And of course, uh, it also arises in, uh, uh, it's also important in sphere packing as well. Here's the Golay code. This is the 12 by 24 matrix whose rows are the basis vectors of the code subspace in R24. So it can correct three bits? Huh? It can correct three bits? It can correct three bits, eight minus one over two. Yeah, greatest integer. Exactly. <clears throat> Actually, the uh, uh, going back to the Hamming code, that can only correct one bit, so it doesn't do any better than our repetition code, but it does have a much better data rate, K over N. All right, so <clears throat> um, that was a quick introduction. Now let me start uh, giving some more mathematical definitions, so which will be useful to us. So uh, a code is called, said to be even if the weight of every code word is even. A uh, code is doubly even if the weight of every code word is a multiple of four. And in particular, a doubly even code is going to have a Hamming distance greater than or equal to four because uh, uh, there are no Hamming distances between zero and four. Um, so is there a misprint there? Uh, code is doubly even if four divides W of C. Uh, I'm sorry, Greg, I couldn't hear that. Is there a misprint on your slide? Code is doubly even if four divides W of C, right? Yes, I'm sorry, you're absolutely right. Four is a, four divides W of C. <clears throat> All right, so so this is uh, if you can find doubly even codes, those will automatically have a Hamming dist a non-trivial Hamming distance. Um, so they're, they're nice in that sense. They have error correcting capability. You can correct at least one bit in a doubly even code. <clears throat> Another important concept is the dual of a code. And that's the set of all uh, words in your space, uh, Z2 to the nth, which um, are orthogonal modulo two to every, uh, every word in your code. So in particular, um, an, uh, an even code is going to, uh, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, just, just uh, uh, I'll come back to what I was gonna say. <clears throat> All right, so, um, uh, so in particular, uh, yeah, in an even code, 
the, um, uh, the code is automatically the, uh, a subset of its dual. All right, because every uh, the C comma C for every uh, uh, element of the code is going to be zero mod two. <clears throat> if, uh, uh, if you have an NK decode, then the dual will have N minus K logical bits. <clears throat> and finally, um, uh, many particularly nice codes, including the Hamming code and the uh, Gole code are self-dual. They have this property that um, C is equal to C star, and that automatically means that K has to be exactly one half of N, K and N minus K have to be equal. And so the data rate is pretty good at 50%, the same as for the Gole code and the Hamming code. So those, as I said, those are both doubly even and self-dual codes. And in fact, uh, uh, doubly even self-dual codes are, well, uh, only exist in dimensions which are multiples of eight. And we're gonna focus on these. They're highly constrained and they're the codes which are most directly related to CFTs. Question is, uh, in the definition of, the, of a dual code, the C comma C prime is the scalar product uh, between C and C prime or the distance, the handling distance between the two? That's the scalar product. The scalar product. Okay. So a convenient way of characterizing a code is called the um, uh, enumerator polynomial. It's kind of like a partition function of a code. <clears throat> what it does is it counts the number of code words of each different weight. All right, so um, uh, it's a polynomial in X and Y. X is there mainly to make it homogeneous. Um, y gets raised to the uh, uh, power of the weight of a code word. And when you sum this over the entire code, the coefficients will give you the number of code words of weight W uh, of C. Uh, so the repetition code, for example, which has just two elements, would have an enumerator polynom polynomial x cubed plus y cubed. For even codes, you'll only get even powers of y because these w's are all even. And then the more non-trivial fact is that if you take the dual of a code, uh, the polynomial gets kind of rotated. The x and y get rotated by 45 degrees. And so this... Uh, 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 um, uh, this is a uh, rather, uh, um, uh, I don't know, I guess it's uh, intuitive, but uh, from some point of view, but, but uh, you can see that if you, if you apply this twice, you're going to get back to where you started. <clears throat> um, so in particular for self-dual codes, we get, we get a very non-trivial constraint on this enumerator polynomial, which is take the star away now because the C is equal to C star. This uh, polynomial has to equal itself when you do this 45 degree rotation on X and Y. And um, it's in fact quite uh, you know, such a strong constraint that, that there's a theorem associated which tells you exactly which polynomials have this property. It's due to Gleason and uh, um, the uh, the theorem says that all um, uh, enumerator polynomials of even self-dual codes are in the ring generated by these two enumerator polynomials. This one is the enumerator polynomial of the repetition code on two bits. And this one is actually the polynomial for the extended E8 Hamming code. So uh, okay. ask a question. Is, yes. is, there a, is there a one line proof or a very easy proof of the uh, relation between the enumerator polynomials of C and C star? Um, it's not difficult, but I, I don't think I could throw it up on the board for you right now. Okay, thanks. It's, it's elementary though. 
All right, so let's, uh, so that's, uh, that's what I wanted to tell you uh, by way of introduction to codes. So let me now shift gears to lattices. And the reason I'm going moving on to lattice is, is my next step is going to be to explain how you can associate any code a lattice. So a lattice is a set of integral linear combinations of some basis of Rn. It's an additive group, it has an inner product that it inherits. And um, uh, a, uh, we say that a lattice is integral if the inner product of any two lattice vectors is an even integer, uh, is an integer. And we'll call a lattice even if the inner product of any two vectors is an even integer. Okay, the dual of a lattice is a set of all points whose inner product with any element of the lattice is an integer. And the lattice is self-dual if this obvious relation holds. So self-dual lattices are especially nice and uh, there's a whole mathematical theory associated with them. And as we know, they arise in string theory and other physics contexts. <clears throat> Uh, a nice mathematical way of characterizing a lattice is by a theta function. Okay? The theta function of the lattice is uh, sum over all lattice vectors, q to be x squared over 2. And sometimes uh, well, we'll, we'll end up taking q to be e to the 2 pi i tau, and we move on to CFTs. So let's do that now. And for an even lattice, you can easily see that uh, this is invariant under shifts of tau by 1. And for a self-dual lattice, we have this uh, duality relation between uh, theta of tau and theta of minus one over tau. So theta is a modular form of weight n over two. And now I can tell you about the relation between lattices and codes. So every uh, binary linear code is associated with a lattice and what you do is you simply take all points in Euclidean space, which re, uh, reduce to the code word modulo two. Actually, these will all be points with um, uh, integer coefficients. I should have said x and z to the n. And, and then we, uh, um, for convenience, we're going to normalize that. We're going to rescale that lattice by a factor of the square root of two. This is called construction A. It's uh, by lattice or by code theorists. It's the uh, one way of associating a lattice to a code. There's also construction B, C, D, and so forth, but I'm not going to talk about them today. <clears throat> um, but under this correspondence, and in particular with that square root of two in there, um, dual codes get mapped to dual lattices. That is, the, the uh, dual lattice of a given code is equal to the lattice of the dual code. Even codes get mapped to, um, I'm sorry, I think this is uh, uh, integer, integer lattice. This should be integer lattices, I'm sorry, yeah. That's a mistake. Okay, even codes get mapped to integer lattices, and but uh, uh, self-dual codes get mapped to self-dual lattices. Um, doubly even codes get mapped to even lattices. And the enumerator polynomial gets mapped to the lattice theta function. And how does that work? Well, you just take the enumerator polynomial of x and y and you replace x and y by two Jacobi theta functions. And um, uh, the claim is that this gives you exactly the theta function I derived on the previous plate page. And the basic idea is that uh, if you have a lattice vector with uh, a certain number of ones and a certain number of zeros, well, having a, uh, a one means uh, that uh, we're doing, uh, when we complete that one, when we extend it by uh, 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 modulo two by even integers across the real line, um, then that is like uh, taking this shifted uh, Jacobi theta function here with n shifted by, well, half a unit. 
and uh, um, and uh, the uh, uh, zeros from a given code word would correspond to theta three once we we shifted them by even integers. So coming back to my question before, this is easy. This uh, is easy to prove, as you just said. So I guess from this and the known transformation laws of the uh, Jacobi theta functions, it's easy to prove the uh, formula for the relation of the weight, uh, the weight enumerator. Uh, yeah, the, it's, it's it's a slightly non-trivial. I mean, not not a, a one of the relations for Jacobi thetas that everyone knows off the top of their heads, but. Into, uh, <laughs> so um, yes, yeah, so theta three of two tau will go to the. But there is indeed, there is indeed a, a theta function identity that reproduces that enumerator polynomial transformation. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so finally we can get to physics, CFTs. So there is a CFT. Um, associated with, um, uh, well, let me be a little more precise here, with, a, with an even self-dual lattice. Um, but uh, and generally, you can consider a free chiral boson if you're uh, uh, not too worried about modular invariance in any number of dimensions. And uh, 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 living on a torus, which is Euclidean space modulo your lattice, Lambda and lambda becomes your momentum lattice in the CFT, and lattice vectors get mapped into primary operators and they generate a vertex operator algebra. <clears throat> and uh, in this correspondence, the code length n gets mapped to the central charge of the CFT. Okay, these are just free chiral bosons, they're the simplest CFTs there are, and uh, um, uh, but. Uh, uh, well, the hope is the correspondence doesn't end here. Anyway, the, um, uh, uh, here's the partition function of one of these lattice CFTs. Um, and these are chiral so far. I'm not talking about Narayan CFTs yet. So the partition function is just the theta function divided by an appropriate power of the Dedekind data function, uh, which gives you a modular invariant expression. And uh, you can write that in terms of tau by the formula I had on the previous slide or two slides ago, which relates the enumerator polynomial to the theta function. All right, so in this partition function, you can say each code word is contributing a, uh, its own sublattice uh, block to Z, which is all of the shifts of its, uh, take that code word and take all the other points in Rn, which reduced to it, modulo 2, that's a lattice, and I'm calling that a sublattice block that each code word contributes, okay? And this is going to be modular invariant whenever C is a multiple of 24. Um, so what we have here is a direct embedding of the code uh, and in which the lattice algebra, which is uh, the lift of the code algebra, to the lattice, uh, the lattice algebra is homeomorphic to the uh, OPE algebra of the primary uh, operators e to the i p dot x. And uh, if you take the lattice algebra and reduce it mod two, you're back to the original code algebra. So that's what I mean when I say that codes are embedded in these lattice CFTs. Okay, and just. Uh, uh, um, I should just say up till now, nothing new. This uh, was uh, this correspondence was all worked out back in the 90s, including by the former IAS director, Peter Goddard, did quite a bit of work on this. <clears throat> all right, so now let's talk about quantum codes. And now, now what we want to do is we want to replace bits by qubits. So we're going to replace code words by code state vectors, which you can think of as, uh, n, uh, as, as n spins, states of n spins. And uh, so we have a two to the n dimensional Hilbert space rather than an n dimensional one. And I'm going to focus on a restricted set of operators. 
which are uh, just operators built out of Pauli matrices. Okay, so each individual spin can be acted on by a sigma matrix. And uh, so a basis for, um, <coughs> for these, uh, so, so the, the operators I'm talking about are, are gonna be tensor products of these sigma matrices. And uh, we can, I guess we can, uh, yeah, so, so, so uh, if I have a general string like this, sigma x tensor, sigma z tensor, one tensor, sigma y, I'm gonna abbreviate that as x, z, i, y. <coughs> okay, so with those definitions, I need to tell you uh, how to define one of the, uh, maybe the most fundamental uh, type of quantum code, which is called a stabilizer code. Certainly the type of code that's most analogous to the binary linear codes, classical codes that I've been talking about up to now. So if we wanna uh, specify a two to the K dimensional subspace of our Hilbert space, the idea is what you do is you take N minus K mutually commuting operators, GI of the type <laughs> of the previous slide, and so, for example, let's take these operators where we have a sigma z in one of the last n minus k positions. And then we project onto their invariant subspace. Okay, that's the most natural way to define the subspace of Hilbert space, it's by projection. And uh, so, in fact, if we do this, with, as I said, with uh, these n minus k operators with a sigma z in the last n minus k positions, that's going to force all the last n minus k spins to be up. And this will be my code subspace will be general vectors that look like uh, the spins are doing anything they want in the first k positions, but they're all up in the last n minus k. So that's a code subspace. That's a very simple, trivial example of a quantum stabilizer code. And um, um, <clears throat> you can get more non-trivial examples by taking this picture and rotating it by a unitary rotation. And, uh, uh, but generally uh, uh, any stabilizer is gonna be some unitary rotation of this very simple picture. Okay, so <clears throat> let me uh, uh, develop a notation for labeling stabilizer operators, I'm going to label them actually by binary vectors with two n components. The first n components I'll call alpha, the second n will be beta. Okay, so it's going to be the product of a string of powers of sigma x with powers of, uh, with a string of sigma z's raised to some powers, raised to the power alpha i and, beta, and sigma z raised to the power beta i. Um, and uh, I claim that any operator of the type I wrote down previously can be written in this form. So for example, if you have the operator I, I, Z, you would just need the sigma Z in the third place here and everything else would be a trivial operator, it would be a one. So the alphas and other alphas and betas would all be zero. So we would uh, call that operator, uh, label that by the vector zero, 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 one. Likewise, I, X, I, you'd have a one in the second position of the alpha vector. And if you had a Y, what you need is a sigma X and a sigma Z in the corresponding position. All right, Al, is, is, y, is Y representing sigma two or the square root of minus one times sigma yes, two? Yes, uh, uh, it's, it's sigma two. And isn't there a square root of minus one missing here? Did I? Uh, X times Y is the square root of minus one. Oh, sorry, X times Z is the square root of minus one times Y. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I guess there's a factor of I in there that I forgot. It won't be important though. Uh, Neiman? So you, uh, the, uh, the subspace you defined by uh, just these mutually commuting projections. Right. Uh, usually people also assume these, uh, these commuting operators to form a subgroup. Right. Is this a simple way of understanding the significance of why they should form a subgroup as opposed to just a set of projections? 
Yeah, we'll get to that. I'm going to actually talk about the group structure right now. Okay, so here's the operator algebra of these uh, operators, these projection operators. Um, and uh, you may recognize this. It's, it, it looks very much like the operator uh, algebra for uh, Dion operators in four-dimensional gauge theory. Uh, it involves, uh, they commute up to a sign, and the sign is given by the symplectic product of these alpha beta vectors. Um, so this is the algebra here of these uh, uh, projection operators in general. It's called the Pauli algebra. This is called the Pauli algebra. And so it's very easy to see when these commute, we want the symplectic product here to vanish modulo two. Um, since we're working modulo two, we can change that minus to a plus sign. And uh, uh, we recognize this now as the Lorentzian inner product with respect to that metric there. That's signature n comma n. <clears throat> All right, so uh, yeah. Um, so does that answer your question? More or less, um, I mean, the, the significance is that these are operators, and so they have an operator algebra. There's the operator algebra, and, uh, and it does help if they form a subgroup because it make it uh, provides a basis for this nice representation. Right. But in principle, if there are just a set of commuting projections, it does define a code uh, subspace for you, right? That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, I. I all right, so, so just as we did in the classical case, now we can specify a stabilizer code by the list of all of these alpha, I, uh, alpha and beta vectors here. But that's going to be an n minus k by 2n matrix of these stabilizer operators. Okay, so it looks, looks very much, but it's twice as wide as the matrix we had for an n-dimensional classical code. Um, I think, uh, let's see. Yeah, we, I think I'll just, you, you can alternatively, I, I just don't want to go into too many details here because I'm, uh, I've got a lot to cover in 15 minutes. Um, so, uh, but you can also specify the code in terms of two times K binary code words, um, uh, that, uh, generate the code subspace. So, <clears throat> Let me go on. Oh. And uh, uh, yeah. We started a bit late, so you can have a spear coming. Oh, that's true. Okay, thanks. Okay. Well, let, let me, uh, I think I can still probably yeah, skip that. Okay, so codes. Um, so, so an interesting observation, I'm not going to make too much of it here, but it's important logically, is that any code of this type, any stabilizer code, um, is actually equivalent, quantum stabilizer code is equivalent to a classical code over the Galois field on four elements. So rather than Z2, we're building codes um, whose, uh, whose bits are, uh, have um, uh, four possible values. And uh, so, so this is what GF4 looks like. It has four elements. Um, uh, omega is something like a cubed root of one, but it isn't really because if you add it to itself, you get zero. Um, but uh, 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 its multiplication table is, uh, is the same as uh, the, the cube roots of one along with zero. And, um, and you can map GF4 to Z2 cross Z2, which is where each alpha and beta component lives um, by this dictionary here, okay? So that means we can associate a general code vector of length 2n with an n-dimensional vector over GF4. <clears throat> and what this does is it allows us to take over a lot of results from classical coding theory, theory and apply them in the quantum context. So <clears throat> in particular, um, we have, there are various results about self-dual codes, some of which I quoted for you about enumerator polynomials and so forth. 
which are going to apply to codes which are to classical codes over GF4, which also have this self duality property. So we're going to focus on self dual codes, <coughs> um, which uh, over GF4 means n equals k rather than uh, n equals 2k. And uh, that means we're not going to have any logical bits in this code. So we'll think of this as an error detecting code rather than error correcting code. There are no wrong bits to correct, but you can see if an error in a general word has occurred and detect it. And uh, so <clears throat> anyway, this is uh, uh, the, the main point here was to explain to you that there is a notion of self duality for these stabilizer codes. And so, so again, with this dictionary uh, relating it to classical codes, we can define all these uh, uh, similar types of properties, Hamming weight, enumerator polynomials. Hamming weight is going to be the number of operators in a string like this, which are not the identity operator. So this, op this operator would have Hamming weight three and the Hamming distance is the minimum again over the whole code. And that, uh, uh, so basically uh, we now know how to define a quantum code of type N, the two to the N dimensional Hilbert space with N, N, N qubits and K logical qubits and a, a Hamming distance or an error correcting capability of D. And we'll distinguish the quantum notation with double brackets. <coughs> All right, the numerator polynomial is defined exactly as before. Uh, actually, we have now we're talking about strings that have not just zeros and ones, but have four possible entries in each uh, component. And so we could have an enumerator polynomial with four uh, in four variables, one for each of these entries. Um, we uh, 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 we actually find something called a refined enumerator a little more useful where we only really count the, the total weight of each code word and the number of Y's in the code word. All right, so this refined enumerator and three variables is related to the uh, W of the dual code by a similar transformation, but not the, quite the same as before on X, Y, and Z. You can check that that transformation squares to zero to uh, the identity. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so self-dual codes are going to satisfy, again, an identity like before, that uh, W, X, Y, Z is W of this, that, and that. Okay? And again, you can prove that these uh, the allowed enumerators all have to lie in a particular polynomial ring which is more complicated. I won't write down for you, but it's, it's straightforward. So we can play all the same games as before. <clears throat> okay. So um, the, uh, just as we associated a Euclidean lattice to a classical code, we can associate a Lorentzian lattice to a uh, stabilizer code. And um, uh, basically you just uh, consider all points in R n comma n that reduce to code words modulo two. All right, and uh, uh, this is all with respect to the indefinite metric zero, one, one, zero. <clears throat> so again, if a quantum code is self-dual, so is the lattice. Again, there's a factor of square root of two. You have to uh, scale this lattice by in order for this to be a true statement. And uh, again, the lattice has a theta function, which is related to the refined enumerator polynomial of the underlying code. So the theta function of the lattice is equal to enumerator polynomial of some combination of Jacobi theta functions uh, of tau and tau bar. Tau and tau bar, I haven't yet assumed are complex conjugate each other to each other. For now, just suppose they are two different modular parameters. Okay. This looks suspiciously like the partition function of a particular type of CFT, and indeed it is. 
This is a particular Narayan CFT. <clears throat> okay, so we're, um, uh, uh, we are now talking about non-chiral CFTs. And uh, uh, so we have a boson living on an n-dimensional torus. It's now a Narayan torus with left independent left and right movers. So it lives in this Lorentzian n comma n metric. And, um, uh, and it's required to be even and self-dual for the CFT to be modular invariant. And it's an especially nice solvable CFT with U1 to the N cross U1 to the N symmetry. In fact, it's probably the only CFT with that symmetry. And its partition function is simply given by the ratio of the theta function of this Lorentzian lattice divided by an appropriate power of the eta function. <clears throat> All right. Um, so, so, uh, um, I should say, I mean, uh, these, are, these are not all Narayan CFTs. These are very particular Narayan CFTs, which correspond to um, these, these very special lattices, which are made out of, essentially out of cubic lattices and their translates. Okay, I think uh, I'll just say a couple words about enumeration of codes. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, I, I talked about how, did, how codes are associated to lattices. Um, I, what I didn't talk about is what happens when you have two different codes, two codes which are uh, basically equivalent to each other, okay, which are uh, uh, <coughs> Which encode information in the same way and, uh, and base some, have some homeomorphism. Their, their algebras are homeomorphic to each other. So uh, uh, it turns out that equivalent codes are related by transformations which are, uh, correspond directly to duality transformations of the CFT, these, uh, to T duality transformations. So, um, uh, in fact, all of these code equivalence transformations, uh, the standard ones that code theorists study for these stabilizer codes, are in one to one correspondence with T duality transformations. And um, <clears throat> so, T dualities are useful in choosing a nice representative for each equivalence class of codes. And uh, they can be used to, to uh, bring the generator matrix for the code to a particular form. Sorry. That's G for generator metric, uh, matrix. It's not G for metric. And, uh, um, uh, but what this, uh, uh, in this form, you can see that, that as for uh, what's happening with the Narayan moduli is that the, the underlying Narayan metric Gij is just the identity, the square, the cubic. So it's, it's just a, an identity matrix. And all of the uh, interesting stuff is contained in B, in the B matrix. And, and B here is uh, uh, a binary symmetric matrix with all entries zero and one, or one, and it's related to the anti-symmetric tensor in the Narayan compactification. All right, and B can also be, because it uh, has this property that it's just made out of zeros and ones, it can also be interpreted as uh, an adjacency matrix for, for a graph with n nodes. And uh, so we can associate to each equivalence class of codes a particular graph. All right, so we use this graph theoretic construction of, uh, of codes to uh, enumerate all equivalence classes of real self-dual stabilizer codes up to length eight. Okay, so now let's return to the, uh, what I call the, the fundamental question of code theory, which is how do we maximize D 
um, the Hamming distance for given n and k. And uh, as I also mentioned in the introduction, this is going to be related to corresponding questions about lattices. What's the minimum length vector of an n-dimensional lattice? Sphere packings and CFTs. What's the minimum weight non-trivial primary vector? So these are all four hard, closely interrelated problems. But one nice thing about uh, uh, focusing on, say, the, uh, the code theory point of view is, is it's a really stripped down problem where we don't have to worry about full uh, <clears throat> OPEs and conformal blocks. It's, it's just very, uh, um, uh, it's, it's sort of stripped down to the basics and the modular invariance or self-duality becomes this simple algebraic relation on polynomials. So you can, <clears throat> so what you can do in, uh, 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 in each of these cases is you can use linear programming or other semi-definite programming, other types of numerical techniques to set upper bounds using the two constraints of modular invariance or self-duality and positivity. So and for the code, we'll call this program the code bootstrap. And uh, so what we want to do is solve an optimization problem. Uh, to, uh, in order to solve our optimization problem, what we're going to do is generate all consistent enumerator polynomials. So we know they all have to lie in this polynomial ring. And we generate all the polynomials in that ring up to a given degree. And then we impose, uh, uh, and, and so that, that enforces the self-duality constraint also known as the McWilliams identity on the uh, polynomials. And we also impose that all the coefficients are positive because we can't have a negative number of code words of a given length. <clears throat> and uh, uh, this allows us to set an upper bound on D for each N. Okay, and we generate this long list of candidate polynomials satisfying these constraints. And uh, in fact, many of the candidate pro uh, polynomials don't correspond to codes at all because we've generated all of the uh, codes up to length eight. We could look at our list of codes and say, oh, a lot of these, these polynomials, for example, of degree three don't correspond to real codes. <clears throat> we also found that many uh, codes had the same enumerator polynomial although they were distinct as codes and therefore the CFTs also were distinct, um, but uh, had the same spectrum. And this started in a dimension as low as seven. Uh, and we found examples of up to, I think, 11 uh, different codes with the, uh, with the same spectrum. <clears throat> so, um, uh, anyway, this is, this is all, uh, I mean, I think uh, one takeaway from this is it really highlights a limitation of the modular bootstrap program, which is essentially because you're not imposing a complete set of, of uh, bootstrap uh, constraints, um, you only have the modular invariance, you don't have the crossing symmetry, uh, solutions to the bootstrap constraints do not imply either the existence or uniqueness of a corresponding CFT. So uh, just beware when next time you find a kink in your exclusion plot. <clears throat> here are some, uh, 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 these, these are all known bounds here uh, uh, for n up to 32. So the, uh, these are bounds on D, and the green dots are upper bounds, and the blue ones also, never mind the blue dots. The orange dots are lower bounds, and so all um, uh, codes, uh, sorry, the, well, so, so this doesn't nail down what D, uh, what the best possible D is. It just uh, tells you it has to be in this range here. Now, there are certain, uh, in fact, up to uh, maybe n equals 24 or five, I think the upper bound is saturated. It's known what code saturates it, but uh, 
when you get higher, it's not known if the upper bound is saturated or not. In fact, it's believed that for a large enough and it's not saturated. So let me talk about what happens to these bounds at large end. Um, so first of all, uh, you, you can, uh, by fairly elementary methods without doing any linear programming, you can establish a lower bound on the optimal D by averaging over all codes, all codes of the type we're talking about, okay? <clears throat> and uh, um, it's surprisingly easy to perform this average. And uh, the result is that uh, the optimal D over N is, as N gets large, is about 0 0.1, is greater than or equal to 0.19. So this is a lower bound on what the optimum D over N could be, okay? In fact, as a bound on CFDs, it's effective because there's always going to be Cs that saturate, uh, codes that saturate this bound. That's because we obtained it by averaging over all codes. Um, <clears throat> in fact, if you look at the uh, distribution of D over N over codes, it turn, uh, turns out that it's uh, in the large N limit, it's delta function peaked at this lower bound. So most codes, an average, a random code, large N code is going to saturate this bound. Hey, there's an, uh, the upper bound is the one we get from linear programming, and you can derive it analytically. Uh, Reigns did that and found an uh, optimal D over N upper bound of about a third. That's been improved slightly, but there's actually a theoretical limit to how much you can improve it using linear programming. And, uh, um, and I don't actually... Uh, at least in a simpler context of classical binary codes. I know what that is, but, but uh, presumably this work of Semero Nitsky would extend to stabilizer codes as well. So, uh, but I, I don't actually know, maybe a mathematician can tell me the answer here, but they're, they're somewhere between 0.19 and 0.33 is the limit on how well linear programming and the modular bootstrap can do. That's reminiscent of the situation we have in the modular bootstrap for uh, CFTs, uh, where uh, we, we know there's a lower bound on what that, uh, uh, um, the dimension of the lowest primary operator can be of something like C over 12, um, but the best people have been able to do numerically with modular bootstrap is about C over nine. And maybe that's as well as they're going to do. All right, so let me say a couple more words about large, large N, then I'll basically be done. Um, so we'd like to be able to uh, uh, interpret large N CFTs as gravitational or maybe quasi-gravitational theories in three dimensions in the case of Naraya uh, CFTs. And, um, but what this, uh, if we believe this picture, it suggests that the uh, CFT corresponding to pure gravity, whatever that is, should have a minimum spectral density because uh, uh, that's the least you could have in a gravitational duel. And if you add anything else, you're adding additional spectrum to the CFT. So uh, non-minimal theories should have a denser spectrum. And so this leads to a conjecture about the spectral density um, of a uh, these large CCFTs. So um, uh, if we compute the averaged partition function um, of Narayan CFTs, where's the, uh, there's the reference. Um, ah, reference to the next page. Um, believed, it's believed to give us the spectrum of pure U1 gravity. So the average spectrum we're saying is then going to be the minimal spectrum. This is only gonna be possible if uh, we have, uh, if the, the code spectrum or the CFT spectrum is infinitely sharply peaked in the large N limit. 
Uh, Al, I don't understand. You have you have dimension one primaries. Right. Is that what you mean by U1 gravity? I mean, gravity. Uh, yeah, uh, that's U1 gravity. Two. That's including the dimension one primaries, right? This is U1 gravity in the terminology of Maloney, Witten, and, and uh, uh, the other folks. Um, I played innocent. The other folks. <laughs> okay, the other folks. Okay. <laughs> I don't like to quibble, but we actually showed it couldn't be reproduced by a U1 trans line state. Right. Okay. Uh, well, but there are U1 primaries in the CFG. That was Greg's question. Okay. All right. So anyway, so so if this is going to be true that the um, uh, that we have this peaking of the spectrum about the minimal possible spectrum. I mean that the distribution of spectra is sharply peaked about this minimal spectrum. Uh, we would uh, expect that the variance of the spectral density should go to zero in that limit. And so we were able to check that by basically computing a, um, a, a correlation function of, of two partition functions or in the, in the code context of two enumerator polynomials and showed that that went to zero. All right, you check that in which, which ensemble of CFTs? Oh, of the code, this CFTs. Is code CFTs. Not in Orion, but code CFTs, right. It's also been shown in the Orion case. <clears throat> All right, so maybe I should retract this statement since, uh, or, or, or <laughs> That's the point. That's the point. I uh, let, let me just say. Uh, let me just add. Uh, some people believe that Narayan CFTs are holographically related, and some people don't believe. <laughs> uh, to uh, uh, Abelian Chern Simons theories in two plus one dimensions, and uh, um, so. Uh, uh, but anyway, in, in any case, the the observation of these folks is that the Narayan CFTs averaged over moduli space uh, gives you something that looks like a sum over handle bodies in two plus one dimensions and therefore uh, suggestive of a gravitational interpretation. So we can ask what happens if we just average over codes rather than over the entire Narayan moduli space. And I can tell you what happens uh, if you average over codes. This is the average denominator polynomial here. I don't know myself how to write that. Maybe there's some fancy theta function identities that I haven't uh, um, uh, used yet, but uh, I don't know how to write this as a sum over handle body geometries as a Poincaré sum. But in the, in the chiral case, it's much easier. And so at least in the chiral case, there is this suggestive interpretation that may be uh, uh, already just this discrete set of code CFTs is somehow uh, uh, averaging over them is giving you gravitational behavior. All right, this is uh, uh, my last slide. Uh, so further directions. Um, uh, obviously, you can. Uh, well, what we're thinking about now is is looking for other types of quantum codes in other contexts. So, uh, um, uh, different lattice constructions. In fact, uh, um, my collaborator Demarski and a student um, Sharon at Weizmann Institute uh, came up with a different lattice, rather more complicated lattice construction, but which allowed uh, one to uh, uh, construct CFTs and Orion compactifications associated with, for example, the hexacode. And uh, um, <coughs> uh, yeah, so, so this is one thing we're thinking about. Uh, you can also say, what about non-binary codes, for example? What about ternary codes or nary codes, qubits? Um, and uh, uh, that uh, I think that that actually goes along with this first line here too. These will these will also require new lattice constructions to achieve. 
<clears throat> and uh, I don't have anywhere near a complete answer yet. Um, there are other realizations of quantum codes in CFTs. Um, uh, Davide Gaiotto found a, a ternary quantum code in an SCFT, four-dimensional four SCFT. Is it? No, I'm sorry, it's two, uh, two comma two. And uh, Harvey and Moore found an example of uh, a realization of a hexacode in uh, 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 supersymmetry algebra of an SCFT. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> another uh, question I'm interested in and I'm thinking about right now is there's a large literature about anionic codes in two plus one dimensions, codes based on chern simons witten theories. And uh, um, <clears throat> and I'd like to know if these are related to the CFT codes uh, that we've been talking about. Okay, so at least in a very naive sense, one can make some correspondences here, for example, between toric code and a, uh, uh, a C equals uh, one uh, boson. But uh, um, uh, I think there's still, <clears throat> I, I still need to understand the correspondence between Chern Simons theories and, uh, uh, and chiral bosons or and Orion theories better. <clears throat> and uh, uh, finally, the big question is, uh, um, uh, well, we've all heard about the error correcting code structure of gravity in ADS space. And so just I'll leave with a wide open question, which is, can we relate our boundary error correcting codes with these bulk gravitational error correcting codes? And that's all I have to say. Thanks. Okay.